uh, this is Jerry Barrett talking. Uh, today's date is uh, April 24th, 1986. Um, I'm interviewing uh, Joe Leonard at Eastern Airline headquarters in Miami. Uh, Mr. Leonard, w would you start by just saying a little bit about what you did before you came to Eastern? Yeah, before I came here, I worked at uh, American for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I worked at Northwest Airlines for about 13 and a half years. And uh, I worked at Boeing for about three years when I first graduated from college. So all, all your time has been in the airline business. Then. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what have you done since you've been here? Well, when I hired in, I was responsible for operation services, which is maintenance and engineering. I had hired in in April of 84, and I had that job until May of 85. In uh, May of 85, I was made executive vice president, and then uh, in September of 85, I was made president of the company. Right. Okay. Um, can you talk about employee relations and what's happened with it since you've been here in terms of negotiations? and? Well, when I first came, um, the uh, 1983 wage investment program, which was put in at the end of 83, was uh, really just beginning to take hold in the spring of 84. Uh, morale was very high. There was a sense of ownership of the company, which uh, later diminished dramatically, I think. Uh, people who had been fighting for many, many years were working cooperatively together. And uh, there was a genuine belief on my part that the employees uh, were trying to work together and the union and management was trying to work together in a way that it, it had not done in the past. Uh, that feeling and that relationship went, went along pretty well until uh, January of 1985 when uh, the company officially notified uh, the unions that uh, there would not be uh, repayment of the 18 percent uh, salary which had been deducted as part of the of the wage investment program. Uh, I was not here when the wage investment program was put together but uh, it is my understanding and I think it's important to point out that from May to the December at least once a month and in several cases two or three times a month at formal meetings, there was a clear indication by management that uh, there had been an agreement in the fall of 83 that the wage investment program would have to go more than a year, that uh, there was an understanding of the parties in 1983 that it was not a one-year program. Uh, and that adjustments would have to be made and that there was the management's understanding there was that there had been an understanding reached that at the end of 84 that uh, the parties would sit down and determine what needed to be done and for 85 and beyond and, and would cooperate in doing that. It became obvious uh, during the board meetings and those sorts of things, uh, company presentations, at that point was reiterated over and over uh, and really was never addressed by the unions. It wasn't denied, it wasn't uh, acquiesced to. It became clear in the late part of 84 the unions had no intention of doing anything without gaining additional equity in the company which may or, or something such as that, more control of the company. Uh, management felt that the stockholders would be uh, significantly shortchanged if that occurred. So that wasn't in the, in the cards. When that announcement went out, uh, there was a letter put out by Charlie Bryan, I believe in January of 85, which basically called Frank Borman and Jack Johnson liars and uh, said that uh, I am, didn't say that they were going to withdraw their support from EI, but implied that people should not participate in EI and, and quite frankly from that point on production rates among the IM went down uh, rather dramatically uh, and uh, 
to a large degree IM participation in the employee involvement activity diminished. Uh, that situation with the IM deteriorated as time went on and got to its low point when we sold the company. Uh, Alpha and the TWU never really actively got involved in the employee involvement activities that were quite active in 84. They set up some steering committees, they made a couple false runs at it, but really never became real active. Uh, the non-contract employees were quite active. They uh, set up employee involvement groups in 1983 and 1984. They were very active at trying to find cost savings and productivity improvements in 83. Uh, I'm sorry, in 1984. And uh, uh, w were very active. They still employ involvement as a uh, coordinated program is kind of taking a back seat as of late and the non-contract employees are kind of groping for to get that going again are somewhat frustrated that it's not moving along actively. Can you talk about the events uh, late in 85 that uh, the sort of protracted negotiations that finally led to the to the sale in, in February 86? Yeah, we sat down uh, uh, made a couple of mistakes. I think uh, we had an agreement with the IAM that was entered to and into in 1985, early part of 85. Um, and that provided a much lower than standard industry rate for mechanics and equipment service people. And, <coughs> but that if productivity improvements were generated within that group, then we agreed that we would pay the uh, IM uh, back dollar for dollar until the point that they reached their 18 percent. Uh, we thought that that was a positive force that would do some of the things that everybody has talked about and nobody was willing to try for a long, long time, that it would uh, indeed be a positive reinforcement for people to work harder and be more productive uh, rather than what had been perceived as negative impacts in the past. Uh, the first quarter there was a one and a half percent pay adjustment to the IAM. It was somewhat calculated and somewhat negotiated. It's really kind of, we, we really did not try to get down and analyze every penny, but we believe that it was about a percent and a half. It looked like it was about a percent and a half. We, we grave a percent and a half. Uh, the first time we really put the system to the test was in September of 1985. Uh, and in preparation for the second quarter's payout on that, it became very obvious to both of us, both of us meaning the company and the union, that we were going to end up every quarter in a big battle. Hmm. Uh, we calculated about a million and a half dollar savings in the second, the third quarter of the year, second time we'd done it, which was about one and a half percent. And the IAM, to the best of my recollection, came up with a number of about twenty-two and a half million. Um, so, and we were arguing, we would refuse to pay it. It was obvious we were going to end up in arbitration or worse yet, go to court. Uh, and we <coughs> went over, uh, Jack Johnson and I went over and met with them one afternoon to see if we could uh, resolve this. And what we really came to out in the parking lot was that we really ought to get off this program because uh, politically the IAM was going to continue to press for enormous productivity improvements. Uh, my definition of a productivity improvement is you do more work with the same head count or somebody leaves the payroll. They were coming up with astronomical numbers uh, uh, based on uh, hypothetical productivity and nobody was leaving the pay payroll and we weren't doing substantially more work. So, in fact, uh, productivity was not real in our judgment, and that was going to continue to be a problem. 
In October, we negotiated a contract with the IEM that basically went back to a start standard format and gave the IEM, in effect, standard wages. It uh, raised their salaries back to the, gave them back their 18 percent by the first of the year. Uh, and really became a standard contract. We did away with the uh, efficiency crediting uh, provision that we had been using. Um, it is unfortunate the timing. <coughs> we negotiated that agreement in the first part of October, and uh, at that time we were doing quite well. Uh, we had at that time a profit sharing pool of about a thousand dollars an employee. We were feeling very good about paying that out. We thought that that would be good. Uh, but in September, the yields were deteriorating rapidly. Uh, we had done uh, some preliminary looks, but uh, with our system, we only do samples on what the yield is actually doing. Uh, but the yield was falling out the bottom, and so was traffic. Uh, to a much greater extent than we ever imagined it could possibly do. Uh, and in that, quite frankly, remain that way for the rest of the year. Uh, but since our negotiations were going on in September and October, when we m reached that agreement, uh, the IAM felt betrayed. They felt that we had hid information from them. I believe they, be they felt that way, uh, which was not the case. Uh, Charlie Bryan made numerous uh, statements that we deliberately underflew the schedule to run revenue away, which uh, was preposterous. Uh, but this is a highly leveraged business, so we went from record profits to record losses in the matter of 30 to 60 days. Mm -hmm. uh, the union's contention is we should have been able to pro project that. Uh, it's subsequently been pointed out to the Mr. Bryan that uh, Carl Icahn, who's a pretty savvy financial guy, bought TWA on the expectation that he'd lose $35 million in 85, and he ended up losing $196 million. So uh, uh, there were an awful lot of people that were stunned at the turnaround in the industry. I mean, it was not only Eastern, it was a lot of airlines. Nobody ended up doing as well as they thought they would. Uh, but that was an unfortunate set of events. There uh, have been a lot of questions in why did you reach that agreement. We reached the agreement because we saw that we'd be in continual conflict. Uh, and we thought we would be able to afford what we had paid. Had the yield stayed up, we would have been able to. Uh, second mistake that we made in my judgment was we settled with the pilots under the promise that if we got the pilots agreement back up to got the pilots to 100% uh, salary of record, everybody recognized that something was going to have to be done uh, in 1986, that the company was uh, undergoing significant losses, but that the pilots who were very suspicious of the IEM, who uh, have a strong dislike for Mr. Bryan, except when they team up to hate management. Uh, felt that they had been unfairly treated vis-a-vis -vis the mechanics in the past and that they were not willing to entertain concessionary bargaining until they were on a par, which they viewed as 100 percent salary of record. Uh, but as soon as they got that, we would proceed into concessionary bargaining and set out to do what had to be done in 1986. Uh, we concluded that. Uh, negotiations uh, with an interim agreement. Uh, by interim agreement, I mean bridging the old agreement to the new one, uh, and then we would set out immediately to negotiate a new agreement. We also canceled a lawsuit as part of that settlement. The lawsuit had been filed earlier in 1985 by the pilots uh, to, uh, ins to try to get their 18 percent back. <clears throat> so we settled that lawsuit, we entered an agreement with the pilots, and we expected to turn around and enter into concessionary bargaining. We did that, but nothing happened. There were in a very few meetings. The pilots uh, 
were unavailable to meet with us. Uh, it was very clear to us that they were dragging their feet. Uh, with the business downturn that was very clear by now, it became obvious that uh, our original strategy of trying to get everybody to 18 percent and then uh, take everybody down a commensurate amount wouldn't work. We simply could not give the flight attendants eight, an 18 percent uh, boost in pay when in fact uh, we were losing enormous amounts of money. The other two groups, we, we believed that we were in a better position than we were at the time that we reached those agreements. Uh, so that was the first change in our strategy to bring everybody up to 100 percent and bring everybody down. The non-contract employees, uh, whatever we did with, with, with the other ground employees who were unionized, we also did with the ground employees. So when the IAM got increases, the non-contract people did proportionally as well. Uh, <coughs> About mid-October, I think it was October the 11th, I sat down with uh, Mr. Schulte, Callahan, and, and Brian uh, and showed them the first look at uh, our projections for 1986, which uh, projected to be about a $265 million loss. So I reminded them of their uh, commitment for concessionary bargaining. Uh, Charlie made a number of speeches about how we had tricked him in, in October and how he had, and in fact he did, he did not front load his contract as much as he probably could have. He tended to back load it because he expected to get $1,000 an employee from uh, profit sharing and he did not want to be taken out of the profit sharing pool. Uh, he assumed that he could get that and get raises later. Uh, having all three union leaders in the room at the same time, mm, there were a few speeches but mostly people were noncommittal. It was uh, None of the union leaders were going to do very much uh, in front of the others. Mm -hmm. Mr. Call Callahan uh, stated that he was glad that he didn't have an agreement uh, because he now didn't have to go through the embarrassment as Charlie had of reaching an agreement and having to turn right back around and negotiate a new one. Uh, later in October, I and Jack Johnson and Bob Shipner and Al Gibson went over and met with the ALPA negotiating committee and we again reviewed in detail what we viewed 1986 as. Uh, so from that point on it was very clear to us that the unions had clearly been notified what the situation was going to be. Uh, sub uh, parallel to the actions that I and Jack Johnson were taking, Mr. Essery and Mr. Borman were conducting a series of meetings with Mr. Wickensinger of the IAM, uh, John Law and John Kerrigan of the TWU, and Mr. Peter Paul and Wickensinger, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Duffy uh, of the Alpha. Uh, from all of the information that we got from many sources, uh, the ad best advice that we got from union leaders, from our own intelligence, from our own experts, was that the unions politically uh, could not or would not step up to the problem and voluntarily take concessions and that it was essential that uh, we have set a deadline because we, it was obvious that we were going to run out of cash if we kept going the way we were going and, uh, and quite frankly very quickly. Hmm. Since the I, TWU had a, an open contract, uh, uh, 
we set out to negotiate with them and, and to as quickly as possible try to get on the clock with them so that uh, we could bring it to a head. We did not believe that any of the unions would make concessions without being forced to do so or at least be negotiating against a fixed deadline. Uh, and subsequent to that, uh, uh, we became concerned that the, the TWU settle uh, and the pilots and mechanics did not, uh, that uh, we would have fixed half the problem and still would have been racing toward bankruptcy, but not, but just at a slower rate, but not an appreciably slower rate. Yeah. So we, and again, in conjunction with the advice that we got from union leaders, uh, we set out to get the pilots on the clock as well. Uh, we got the uh, flight attendants on a January 20th deadline, and we subsequently got the pilots on a February, I'm sorry, uh, February 25th, I think, deadline. Uh, We concluded in our analysis and in our strategic planning that uh, concluded in our planning that if we did not get the concessions that were required, we were looking for our original projection of two hundred sixty three million dollar loss had grown as yields continued to deteriorate and uh, so we felt that we needed around $400 million concessions in 1986 from our business plan. And some of that was funny money and that we had not given, those were future raises that had not actually been given that we were counting. But we needed about $400 million in order to make sure that we reached a profit level and to have some cushion because we really didn't know what yields were going to do. We had an uh, outside uh, consultant give an estimate that he thought our losses could be as great as $700 million. Mm. And uh, so we felt that we were asking for what we had to have, but really was still at a significant risk, uh, just asking for the $400 million. We knew that it would be difficult to get that and concluded that if we didn't, uh, that we would probably have to file Chapter 11 and there was a great deal of concern that Chapter 11 would immediately lead to Chapter 7. Mm -hmm. uh, we were running low on cash, <coughs> and uh, uh, we felt that with the success of Continental and, how, and the amount of uh, competition that Continental had placed in the, in the marketplace, the carriers such as Continental and Delta and American would invest enormous amounts of money to ensure that Eastern failed to Chapter 11, because uh, if Eastern came out of Chapter 11 with a cost structure similar to Continental's, a very uh, disconcerting effect on the entire industry, particularly Delta and America. Uh, we then s looked for other alternatives and uh, felt that a, a viable alternative would be to sell the company to if we couldn't get concessions. The first choice was always to get concessions and continue Eastern as it was. The second alternative was to get somebody who had the resources uh, to sustain Eastern in bad times. We think Eastern's a good company. It's got mar good marketing capabilities. It's got a lot of assets of a tremendous debt. And uh, with our leverage, we have a tough time riding the hard times out. Uh, in the long run, we believe that Eastern is a very valuable property. So we looked to see if there were other people who would be willing to take a stake in Eastern. We looked at, uh, n went to another number of airlines. Uh, we went to several oil companies to see if perhaps they uh, would be interested in Eastern. Oil companies are very profitable. There's some synergy with oil companies and airlines, and uh, we have tremendous uh, tax loss carry forwards that would be attractive to people who were making very large profits. But our debt structure scared everybody away. Uh, we got on the clock with the flight attendants and the pilots. We went down toward a deadline of the 25th. And uh, uh, 
we found through Merrill Lynch that there was some interest uh, for Mr. Lorenzo to, uh, to purchase the company. Uh, we did some preliminary uh, look-sees, but not significant. We, our f again, our first alternative was try to keep Eastern a separate entity. Uh, we were coaxed by the board um, to, uh, well, not coaxed, the board was absolutely committed that they would not let the company run out of cash and not have any opportunity at all to come through a Chapter 11. So we got toward the end, we were checking cash on a daily basis. We got in a very serious situation. We were losing uh, in it, uh, toward the end in excess of $2 million a day. And uh, our cash was draining out. And uh, so we did not feel that we could uh, go into a strike and have any opportunity to come out uh, of a Chapter 11. So we, we kept all of our options open for as long as we could. Uh, finally, the negotiations with Mr. Lorenzo got serious really the last weekend before we sold the company. Uh, we negotiated with the unions over that weekend to try to get settlements. Uh, we got agreements with the pilots and the flight attendants, although they came way too late in my judgment. I think if we ever had any opportunity to get the IM to, to come along with what needed to be done, we really needed agreements with the flight attendants and the pilots uh, early in the afternoon on that Sunday in order to give enough time to, for the pressure to build on the IM leadership. And I think, uh, I don't know that we ever had a real shot at it, but if we did, uh, I think that's the only way it would have worked. The flight attendants and the pilots stood out uh, trying to squeeze every drop of blood out of the turnip. And in fact, we didn't have an agreement until well after midnight with the pilots. We uh, had an offer out on the table, but the time expired on the flight attendants, so we really never made an agreement with the flight attendants that night. Uh, turns out that Bob Callahan was in the boardroom sensing the mood of the board and uh, the mood of Charlie Bryan, and when he sensed that Bryan may be giving in, he would call and tell the people to pull stuff off the table uh, because he thought his position then was enhanced. He saw that Charlie was remaining stubborn. He was encouraging him to settle. Uh, so it was an impossible bargaining situation. Mm -hmm. Totally unethical in Mr. Callahan's viewpoint, in my judgment, as a board member. We had Charlie Bryan, uh, as I've been told, I didn't witness it, but uh, giving notes to Randy Barber to take outside and give to the uh, Wall Street Journal about the happenings of what was going on in the boardroom. Again, totally unethical in my judgment. But nonetheless, we did not get an agreement with Mr. Bryan. And uh, uh, we felt that if we did not sell the company that night, uh, that uh, we would probably have to file a Chapter 11 before we got to a strike deadline. That, uh, uh, we had to have some protection before the strike deadline or the cash would run out of the company. I think uh, as a board member, the board would be extremely criticized if we had turned down what was deemed to be a fair offer for the company, and uh, a few days later filed Chapter 11. Uh, and so with a fair offer on the table and, and the only offer that we had received uh, with a lot of inquiry, we decided to sell the company. We con subsequently got an agreement with the flight attendants and the pilots, which, which were basically what we were looking for. We didn't get quite all we were looking for with the flight attendants. We did with the pilots. Uh, and we, with the uh, contract employee, non-contract employees, we've 
uh, change their wages and working conditions commensurate with the same as we did with the pilots and flight attendants. The mechanics have not come to the situation yet, but we continue to try to get them to do that. And uh, the situation is really untenable. We have very, very significant problems with the current situation. We have supervisors who are working for $400 less than the people that they supervise per month. Uh, we have what has been an historic relationship where agents make slightly more than ramp service employees uh, are now making uh, considerably less than ramp service employees. Uh, it has really upset the, the real equity balance throughout the company. We've lost a number of maintenance supervisors uh, and managers, uh, which are at a premium right now. So the situation is very, very hard to live with, and as time goes on, will be uh, more and more of an irritant to the rest of the employees. The, uh, th there was part of the agreement at, at some point included having more um, supervisory authority placed in lead men. It has, has that been as a bad problem as a result uh, of that? It has been. It, it's uh, part of the uh, 1983 plan and the 1984 uh, employee involvement program revolved around giving more responsibility to leads and having fewer supervisors. And I think most of us in management felt we had a lot of supervisors. And uh, as long as EIM was willing to uh, enhance the uh, responsibility and, and understand that uh, increased authority also came with increased responsibility of the lead, I thought it was a good plan. I, I myself strongly support it. Uh, at Northwest, we we had very few supervisors. In fact, at the line stations uh, in in the IAM group, there are, there are no supervisors outside the main base, uh, and very few managers. A station like Washington D.C., for instance, for maintenance has one maintenance manager uh, and no supervisors. The leads literally run the operation. They're held accountable and they're responsible. And I uh, supported doing that here. Uh, it has not worked. In fact, it's been a disaster. Mm. Uh, and we are currently putting additional supervisors back in at many, many points. The, the leads just uh, have not stepped up to the, to the problem or to the responsibilities to the extent that they have to in order to make the operation run. Uh, there has been a very, very strong anti-management sentiment at Eastern, I think, for 50 years. I've, I've been in the industry for 20, and I've heard about it since the day I walked in. Uh, and I think that has part as a cultural problem where uh, uh, I think a number of people in the IAM don't want to assume the responsibility. I should say that there are some leads that are apt that are excellent. I mean, they go out, they run their operation. Uh, uh, when their people aren't doing their job, they, they pull them up and uh, straighten them out, help them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has not been enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as time goes on, we might uh, very slowly go to that. I just think we tried to do it too fast, and I don't think that the uh, cultural changes of that magnitude and that those types are that easy to adapt. Uh, you, you did lose a, uh, through early retirement or other movement out of the, out of the corporation, a number of uh, uh, skills to yes. do that, that first line supervisory level. Which in itself is hard to replace. I yes. Yeah. We also did the same for mechanics and supervisors. We we had a number of mechanics that took early retirement, and uh, uh, 
we lost a lot of skill in that area too, in the maintenance area. We lost some in the ramp. We lost a goodly number in the ramp service as well, but they're easier to replace than the 30-year mechanic. Uh, mm -hmm. Knows all the shortcuts and yeah. efficient ways of getting things done. Uh, your your strong suit when you first arrived here was in the in the maintenance area, yeah. and uh, I I've heard. Uh, Th there were a number of improvements made as a result of your arrival and changes you made. Has that, b by other problems, sort of been blurred, or some of the things that you put into place, is it, are they still there? I don't know. Man, it's sure running bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I. I I can't say, I don't know if there were improvements, you can, certainly can't say that with the operation running as poorly as it is, and it's running very poorly. Uh, so I, I don't know, I, I think that uh, I tried to instill a can-do attitude, and I think I see some remnants of that, although we, we lost some momentum in the last year or so. Um, I don't know. I just can't comment on it. it mm -hmm. It's it's so bad that it's hard to see much that you can say, yeah, that's a real star down there. But I mm -hmm. that, that must be disappointing. Because <laughs> you know, to, I mean, is, to you personally, it's a bit disappointing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is it um, uh, is it too simple to say that uh, the problem has been the fact that the unions have been difficult? Uh, I mean. It, uh, if we were talking about um, Delta, would the would none of this have happened? No, this wouldn't happen at Delta. I think that uh, again, I don't know where the labor situation went wrong, but it's 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 been a tough labor group for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the employees at Eastern are spoiled. I think they've had their way. I, I, it's Eastern is, is clearly a company that's run for employees, or by employees, for employees. It's, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you see it in a number of ways. There's uh, discipline needs to be improved. Uh, I'll give you an example which stands out to me all the time. You walk on our airplane and the uh, first class uh, overhead bin on the DC-9s has a lock on it, and that's so that the flight attendants can put their personal belongings in there and lock it up so our first-class passengers can't get access to it. Uh, I can tell you that wouldn't happen at, at other airlines. And uh, I think that is a vivid example that, uh, and I don't think anybody other than myself ever even notices that as being unusual. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's an example of, of the way the company is run. Uh, there is a notion at Eastern that I have not seen anywhere else. I think I understand why, but the employees at Eastern, and I've talked to all the union heads about it, are not willing to do, to put any pennies in the bank for tomorrow. Uh, and it, there is absolutely total unwillingness to defer a little bit today for tomorrow. Now, the mm -hmm. employees will argue and say, well, I've given up, given up, given up. But the problem is they've always waited too late, and so that the give up was more costly than if they had uh, done a little, a little more cooperatively earlier. Uh, the pilots will argue with that. They they will say in 1982 uh, we gave up a lot simply because Colonel Borman sat and convinced us that's what we should do. And, uh, and uh, apparently that happened. And uh, I think you have to pat them on the back for that. They don't think that we understand that. I, I do. I think that uh, they did uh, do some things that they didn't absolutely have to. The problem is in 83, when they had a big settlement with the IAM, they then felt betrayed. And I've heard that story at least 123,000 times. 
But, uh, so you end up with these jealousies uh, in uh, what is perceived as inconsistent or, or not fair treatment, mm -hmm. equitable treatment. It creates uh, real long-term problems. But uh, I, I go back and, you know, I was an American in 1983 and Bill Huskins, who I followed here, Bill was a very close friend of mine. I worked for him for, gee, seven or eight years. And uh, I was an American and we were negotiating with the TWU, which represents the mechanics. Bill was here <coughs> and was negotiating with the IAM. An American ended up getting two tier wage scales, uh, part time employees, total cross utilization, lots of work rule changes. And Eastern ended up giving a 38% raise, which it had no way in the world of affording. And I often think if, if those two events, and they happened about 30 days apart from each other, were reversed, where Eastern would be today and where American would be today. Mm. I think history would uh, have a totally different picture uh, of the situation. But that settlement in 1883 uh, really set up the dynamic, March of 83 set up the dynamics for, in, in retrospect, where it may have been an irreversible path to where we ended up. The, um, you, you alluded to, you referred to earlier the, uh, the fact that um, efforts at measuring productivity uh, proved to be so controversial that you finally really dropped using those kind of measurements. I, is that um, just typical of uh, trying to measure uh, changes in productivity um, in, a, in an organization as complex as the as maintenance, for instance? Well. We measure productivity, and I think we sh we, we've improved productivity uh, a dramatic amount. You, with the way the operation is running, you'd have to say too much. Uh, I'm still convinced that there's a good deal of productivity left. Um, I personally am not a, a person that, that feels that industrial engineering standards and uh, work standards and those sorts of things are the most productive way. I, that is not my natural bent. Mm -hmm. uh, I normally do manning by walking through the shop and counting the number of people that are s talking. Uh, but I have become convinced and we are going to do industrial engineering studies to measure what our productivity is so that uh, in the event that Charlie Bryan puts out a letter and says, I hate Jack Johnson and Frank Borman, as he did in January of 85, and productivity stops, then people will start to be disciplined severely about that. And uh, it will be resisted, and we simply will just move forward and do it. But, uh, so that is an active program. We're just getting started with it, but uh, we will go in the engine shop and, and measure well, there's two ways of doing it. You can measure how long it takes to do an individual item, or you can watch people and see what percentage of the day they're actually working and develop standards either way. Both are uh, rather standard ways of measuring productivity, and we're mm -hmm. going to do that. Uh, and then we're going to hold individuals responsible for if, if a job takes eight man hours, then they ought to produce one of whatever that is every day. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, they're going to be held accountable for it. Uh, we'd like to get in a situation where they produce two, they'd be rewarded for it. But, uh, we've tried that, and uh, thus far we haven't been able to come up with a workable system, but I'm hopeful that one day we will. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you, you felt it, it isn't then a matter of the work rules themselves. It's, it's performance. Really. I mean, it's the, it's the behavior on the job, really. I think right. it's... Uh, it's partly both. There's work ethic involved, and I, I think we have a lot of room for improvement in work ethic. Uh, and the work rules are cumbersome. We, we cannot cross-utilize a cleaner and a ramp service person, for instance, at, at most of our stations. It's absolutely ridiculous. 
Uh, we have some de facto rules that we have, I think, done a pretty good job of breaking down. We had radio mechanics and AMP mechanics. And radio mechanics didn't do AMP work and vice versa. We have just insisted that that change. Uh, under the contract, I believe that we have the ability to have aircraft mechanics do automotive work and vice versa. Uh, but because of persistent nagging over the years that that's not permissible, management has sort of acquiesced to that. And uh, we intend to change that, although we've not gotten very far with that one yet. But each of those is a real struggle in and of itself, and uh, uh, I cannot find anything in the contract that prohibits that. So we will be pursuing those sorts of things as time goes on. But those are sort of de facto work rules that have grown in through years and years of uh, chipping away at the contract. And they're hard to <coughs> reverse. Sure. Okay, um, we're back on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, at the role that USRI played in all of this? Yeah, I think uh, I don't think we'd have made it without Bill, to be honest. And uh, uh, Bill has an uncanny ability, as you know, to uh, see the world through different people's eyes. I know I, I see it through management's eyes and. Uh, and the union sees it through theirs. And uh, we think we understand each other, but I don't think we really do most of the time. Uh, Bill really does have the ability to understand both perspectives. Uh, I think Bill helped us uh, communicate uh, better than we could have possibly done so. Uh, he helped us in regard to the government. I don't think that uh, it was very important for us to get on the clock. We were, we were going toward bankruptcy, as I mentioned, at a very fast rate. And we had to bring it to, a, we had to, bring it to an end point. There mm -hmm. just had to be a deadline on which we had to negotiate. Because I am absolutely convinced that had we not got on the clock, we still wouldn't have an agreement and we would probably be in bankruptcy certainly Chapter 11, maybe even Chapter 7 by this point. Uh, and so Bill helped us quite a lot with, with uh, dealing with people in Washington. Uh, uh, Bill helped a great deal in, in developing the strategy, labor relations strategy. And he did a tremendous job of working internally with Eastern, and, and I think as much of his effort was geared toward keeping ensuring that everybody on the management team stayed on the team. Mm. A lot of Eastern has had a problem in the past with people who uh, uh, would sit there and nod yes and then walk out of the room and say that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard and I wouldn't do it that way and those sorts of things. Uh. And Bill sensed that uh, very early on and, and worked very hard to make sure that you're either on the team or you're off the team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, if you're off, get the hell off, and if you're on, sign up and hang with us, because uh, we knew it was going to be a very tough road to hoe. It was. Uh, a lot of personal attacks and those sorts of things. And uh, I think that Bill really helped us a lot in that regard. Uh, he helped us communicate with the unions in a way that we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And he really helped us just stay the course and not, you know, not chase off after some red herrings that were out there. Um, one of the things that, that I had heard uh, that was a change made that sort of put you in the position that you're in had to do with the, the need for maybe there being a chairman and a president. Um, has, that, has that helped a lot? I, I, maybe you're the wrong person to ask about that because you, have a, you obviously have an interest in that particular job. But has has that helped as far as the operation of the organization is concerned? Well, I don't know. Uh, like I say, I'm probably not the best guy to comment, but uh, Frank has told me that he doesn't 
it, it really helped him a lot to get through this crisis because he could uh, he could focus on trying to get the deals put together and trying to uh, uh, communicate with people outside the company and those sorts of things and didn't have to worry about are the airplanes getting off the ramp today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I, I think from that standpoint it, it there was just such an intense amount of time and intense pressure on this thing that splitting duties up had to help I think both of us do you, do you ever reflect back now and wonder whether you shouldn't have stayed with American that uh, no. the, uh, I, I, when you arrived was the situation as good or as bad as you anticipated it was much better than I anticipated oh, I, oh, I, oh. I uh, quite frankly came here uh, accepting the fact that I might be gone within six months. Mm. Uh, first of all, the job that I came into uh, has been a people eater. There haven't been many people survive that job. Uh. And uh, secondly, uh, I really did not know if Eastern would be in business for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I told Bob Crandall the last time I met with him, he asked, why in the world are you doing this? This is, uh, you know, and I told him, you, you understand why I'm doing it more than anybody else that I know. I, I want to go down and slay dragons. <laughs> and, uh, I did not realize how fast they breed. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. they've been uh, breeding faster than I've been slaying. But, uh, no, I uh, I never look back. I you know when I left when I left American, uh, I left and uh, I have not regretted coming here at mm. all. It has been uh, uh, much tougher changing the culture than I thought it would be, uh, and it's taking much much longer. I'm fr I'm frustrated at that. I. Uh, I think my image is one of being a pretty stern guy and kind of a hard ass, but a guy that's people oriented and that uh, really likes people and likes to get things done. Uh, I have never been confronted with the uh, personal attacks that, that I've been subjected to here, and, and in large part. Mm. Uh, I don't think for any good reason. I mean, some of them started the very day I came in. Uh, and so that gives you an uphill battle here. You're not only trying to deal with the problems at hand, but you have people going out saying the reason that we're having maintenance problems is Leonard sold all the inventory, when in fact I think we have the largest inventory of any airline in the business. We have 400 million, and we should have about 225 million, and uh, those sorts of things. And they're very deliberate, and they were done by people for very specific reasons. But, uh, so you feel that if you if you were starting with a neutral base, then mm. you could do a lot more, and it just makes it tougher and slower. Did you know Borman before you arrived here? No. And, uh, I came down and we had had a number of telephone conversations and uh, I came down and spent a Sunday afternoon with him and we talked at length and, uh, and I went back and gave it some consideration, did some more talking and then decided to come. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that I consulted with uh, told me I was crazy <laughs> and yeah. strongly recommended that I not come. Yeah. But uh, being foolish, I yeah. decided to give it a shot. There's a lot of communications between companies uh, so that people have a good assessment of how things are going at American if you're at Eastern or the reverse. So you had all that kind of Oh, yeah. Information. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are your styles of management, uh, Frank Borman's and yours, similar? 
No, I think they're dramatically different, mm -hmm. and I think they probably complement each other. Frank is uh, very fast, uh, one of the brightest people I've ever run across. Uh, comes to conclusions quickly and, um, and reacts immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more of a methodical type person that says, fine, I know what I want to do, but I'm going to I don't have to make that decision until next week, so I'm not going to make it till next week. Okay. And, uh, uh, so I think we, we work well together. I think we're both, uh, we both come from engineering backgrounds, so I think from that standpoint we've got a lot of similarities. We, we're uh, logical mm -hmm. type people and that sort of thing. And Bob Callahan continues, continually reminds me that uh, our biggest problem is we keep trying to use logic when uh, fear and greed are what we really should be playing to, <laughs> which is good advice, I think. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, so. you're, you're more comfortable with having all the numbers and the data in front of you before sure. you uh, make a decision. Yeah. Although I think I have a good gut feel. I mm -hmm. think I, uh, I try to stay close to things enough so that I think over time you develop a sense and you can you can uh, make decisions based on your sense of things probably more than the data. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think I've uh, run out of questions to okay. post to you uh, and I've used up all of your time, too. We appreciate the okay. chance to talk Thanks with you. Thanks a lot. Okay.